How are you, Beryl? All good. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Amazing. It's great. We're really excited to talk to you. In fact, I, I think Amy and I had a problem narrowing down all of the questions to so just so many questions within an hour. <laughs> That's good. That's a good sign. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. Today, we've got artist, designer, activist Sebastian Rosseriz. And wow, is he an interesting guy. He was born in Chile, raised in London, studied design in Santiago, and got his MFA at New York University. He works across multiple disciplines and has created works in the form of giant public art projects, experimental furniture, women's shoes, motorcycles, and functional sculpture. He's had work auctioned as part of Sotheby's important 20th century design. ID Magazine listed him as one of the top emerging international designers in 2007, and in 2010, he was named Chilean Designer of the Year. In addition, his work has been collected and exhibited by many museums and galleries internationally. His work is surprising, compelling, and provocative, often triggering you to rethink realities that we take for granted. And Sebastian the person is as captivating as his work. Just listen to this. My name is Sebastian Erasuris. You've got to roll the R's. It's a horrible surname. I'm Chilean and I'm based in New York City. I'm an artist and a designer, a bit of an activist. And I try to break down the barriers between these different disciplines, attempting to bring existential, conceptual, psychological elements to a functional piece or trying to create an art piece that can actually function, which is supposed to be a no-no in the arts. So I, I walk that weird line. I'm a bisexual, trans, or something of the sorts within these disciplines. I try to be multilingual. I think it's a better definition of who we are. It's, it's less uh, boxed into a, into a single category. It's a little more complex. It takes more time, more explaining. Nevertheless, it is ultimately uh, more human and more real. So you were born in Chile and raised in London, correct? Exactly. Okay, so describe your childhood for us. What was your family dynamic like? Okay, so I'm the oldest of four brothers. My parents are both teachers. And my father is a, a professor of arts. He specialized in art education and how to educate art. And that was crucial for my upbringing because basically I become his guinea pig for all his theories. This is uh, an extremely rigorous man who then ends up designing the school program for every single kid in, in Chile, in my country. And so every single kid in Chile, the program they learn in school from kindergarten to 18 is the program my father designed. We lived in London while he was doing his PhD. So the whole family was there in a little extra time. And basically it was like uh, being brought up in a conservatory. It's like one of those kids that plays the violin since age three, or if you're brought up in the circus or something of the sort, you could say I'm classically trained and it was an extremely rigorous form of training. So to give you an idea at age five, I would basically be going every single weekend of my life to museums. And within those museums, let's say we're at the National Gallery, I would be asked to walk into the uh, Turner room, William H. Turner, and be able to identify within that room. I was asked to identify which was the first painting of the room, which was the last painting in terms of a series. Mm. What were the early paintings, which was the last? Uh, in the same way, then in each single painting, you had to be able to identify where the artist had started painting and where they ended painting. Whoa. And then finally, the trickiest one was where was the artist painting freely, unaware of themselves and really sort of lost in it? And where were they having trouble? Where were they going at it again and again and again? Oh my gosh, that's fascinating. That would be such an amazing thing to try and dissect. Exactly. And I'm not saying I could answer all of that at five, but that's what was being asked. And it would be asked at six and at seven and at nine and at 12, plus a series of other things. So you basically start seeing things in a different way. You start understanding how things are made. At the same time, I was very lucky that um, I also liked the arts and I was, I was quite good at it. So I was the kid who would win all the drawing competitions and so on. Now, None of that was ever good enough for my dad. If I was already doing a very well-proportioned portrait, 
that looked exactly like the person I had in front. He would still bug me about the fact that my lines weren't using all of the subtlety that they could. So he would always tell me off, to what point am I going to continue using the same stupid line when lines should be uh, thicker or thinner, uh, deeper or, or uh, less uh, deep and, and darker or, or not, depending on what I wanted to say. And that proportions weren't enough. And at what point was I going to understand these other subtleties? In the same way, how much of that paper to fill, how much of that paper to leave in white and the importance of, of uh, vacuums versus fills and so on and so on. So that's, that's my upbringing. By the time I'm 18, my allowance depended on making my father's cards for the university. So every single class he would do, his cards that he had to read out the slides, I was filling in the night before. So if it's, uh, I don't know, Picasso, Blue Period, 1913, whatever, blah, blah, I had a stack of books and I'm going through slide by slide and checking it. So you could imagine by the time I'm 18, I, I worshipped artists. It was the only thing I wanted to do. Nevertheless, they were in such a pedestal that I didn't feel worthy of being one. And it didn't depend on the knowledge. It didn't depend on do I know the curriculum because I already knew the curriculum. I was already taking classes with university students when I was 15. I already was preparing my dad's classes, uh, like helping him out with the material. So it was more, do I have it in me? Do I have that spark? If not, it doesn't matter. And could I be one of these people that I always wish to be? I never wanted to be an astronaut or a football player. I, I only wanted to be an artist. Uh, and so within that, design seemed like an amazing opportunity because it wasn't about me. It wasn't about my ego, my story, my neurosis. It was about helping others. Design offered a complete other universe, another vocabulary. It was all about structures and problems and technical issues and processes and machines and so on. And I figured, okay, I'll, I'll study design, which makes more sense. I did that, did quite well in that, but then was missing the arts. And that's where I start mixing both. Growing up with such a rigorous curriculum regarding the arts, did that uh, put unnecessary pressure on you, do you think? Or do you think it was a head start, an advantage? There's absolutely no chance I could be doing what I'm doing without that upbringing. Okay. Zero chance. And in a weird way, I feel... It's literally as if I wanted to be in the Olympics doing uh, acrobatic gymnastics, and I decided I wanted to do that at 17 or 18. There's just no way you can catch up on time. Mm -hmm. You just can't. It's, it's, it's physically impossible. Here, it's not that it's physically impossible, but obviously it's a huge difference. If you at 16 decided that you kind of liked the arts and you drew kind of okay and you were doing certain things and you know what, I'm going to go into one of those areas. Then if you were trained for this as a guinea pig, it's a different mindset. It's, it's like being in the army. Yeah. It sounds like your dad was, well, extremely influential, but also a tough coach. Very, very tough. Very, very tough. Did you ever feel his approval? No, uh, I never had his approval. And I was a kid who was winning every competition. And I always strive to, to try and get that approval. My name is Juan Sebastian, basically for Johann Sebastian Bach. So my father would direct imaginary orchestras right in the living room, like most of us do. Whenever I would do a, a project later on, I would always save a little bit of money on a side to go to the subway and find those classical musicians that play in the subway and have a couple of them play at whatever show I was going to do just for my dad. Like I was always trying to get his approval. And I remember this one time at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Chile, I, I had a piece in a group show uh, I bumped into one of the people that works there and they said something like, your dad is so happy and proud of you. And I said, my dad, no way. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 your dad, he's so happy. Like you can see him, he's drooling of happiness. I was <laughs> like, no fucking way. That's not my dad. My dad's not <laughs> that person. They were like, no, no, I, for real. I went and, and at the opening, I confronted my dad. And I was like, dad, so-and-so just said that you were super happy. What's with that? Because up to then, you've got to understand that uh, I would win the whatever school competition, come back with my drawing, and my father would say, mm, that's, uh, that's interesting. I think what you did here is, is, is uh, okay. Uh, this side is very weak. Keep working. That would wow. be all I get. My friends would all have their drawings on, on their refrigerator, right? They would have them everywhere. I would just get that. I was the kind of kid that would draw 
And if the drawing wasn't good, I would crumple up the drawing and throw it away and make sure no one ever saw it. I remember this one time I would even take them in with me out so no one would find them, not even in the wastebasket, because I was ashamed that that drawing was not what it should be. So all of that, I asked my dad, so what's going on? What's with this? And we went and we had our first beer, father-son beer in a bar. And he told me that he had never wanted to, to tell me the work was good, so I would never stop. And he didn't want me to settle. And he apologized for all the times he had been hard on me. He understood how hard it had been, but he just thought I had something that I could contribute and it was worth pushing. I feel like I continued to do, I continued to try and get his approval maybe until I was 30, early 30s, 32, 33, something like that. Today, I, I don't care if my dad likes it or not anymore. I, I love him and some he shares, some he gets, some he doesn't. What doesn't was the change. turning point? What, at what point were you like, you know what, I just don't care anymore? What made that happen? I think he also relaxed. He at some point understood the level of pressure that it had been. But then, for example, I had a, a, a design sold at uh, Sotheby's in the 20th century important uh, designs. And I was maybe, I don't know, 28 at the time, 27. And we had lived in London. So for my father to go to Sotheby's, pass by to get the catalog, it was a very sort of elegant and luxurious environment that normally he would have never been a part of to be able to grab that book and see his kid there. I think for him, it was a twist point for me, maybe too. But I think ultimately you just, you have to end up killing your father in a way, right? As, a, as an image and be happy with yourself and find your own things. And are you able to look back on your childhood now and, and sort of recognize that he was doing this all out of support and love or does it still feel hurtful? No, no, absolutely out of support and love. Um, I thank my dad every time I, I, I see him. I'm so thankful and so grateful. And I know he loves me enormously and I love him enormously. Um, I had a happy upbringing. I was a bit of an existential kid, but um, this was just, I don't know, some kids have a really rigorous father who tells them off all the time or who grounds them all the time. I never had that. I had a father who always expected more. In a way, it's a sign that, that he believes that you're capable of more, and that's actually the ultimate compliment, right? I would hope so, because otherwise he would be a, a bit of a torturer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so growing up surrounded by all of this art and with educators for parents, how did that shape your worldview? I think there's something really interesting of having the opportunity to live in a couple of different continents. The British have this incredible humor and wit, right? Uh, but at the same time, a very dry and to the point. And uh, if you mix that with the Latin flair and, and rebelliousness and, and the idea that everything in, in, in the Latin world is connected, that we're all connected as people, no one's an individual. And you live in a place with a huge amount of disparity uh, in terms of uh, economics or culture. And therefore, you have to be responsible, not only for your family and your people, but for others, too. I think was was very, very helpful because on one side, you you acquire a, a position and the ability to sort of poke and, I don't know, connect. That's very British. But then at the same time, you understand that you're also responsible for what you're doing. It's not just about you. And, and you need to somewhat uh, help out others and that whatever you make is there for a reason. So I think all of that and the idea of integrating everything in Chile, if your cousin's girlfriend, it's her birthday, you have to go. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everyone gets annoyed at you. You end up having to go to a million family events and then you have to go to your friend's sister's boyfriend's birthday and so on. <laughs> There's this weird sense. It's almost like the Italians where we're all connected. We're all codependent. And in that sense, that also means that if one of your friends needs you, uh, whether to defend him in a fight because he's drunk or because he needs money or because of whatever, you have to be there. So I think that's all quite intertwined. And, and today in my work, I try to do a, a, a wide variety of things that are all interconnected. And, and for me, the idea of both awareness and responsible contribution are, are very, very important. Yeah, I can see that in your work. It's so wonderful to hear all of this information on your backstory. I know that you had a rigorous 
upbringing with your father. And I'm wondering, was there any point in your creative evolution that you started to rebel against what he was teaching or what he expected of you? Or, or did you train like you were going for the Olympics or both? Sure. I, I, I think it's a mix because on one side, uh, I always rebelled and we always got into fights with my father. Like we've been, we, we fought for the first 25 years about everything. Like I was a very old, like, like a very old soul. And I, I must've been four. I think I was playing soccer with my little brother who was two in the corridor and playing soccer was forbidden because the ball would mark the white walls so my father comes in and he said, I've told you so many times and smacks me. And that was the first and only time my dad smacked me. And I get smacked, I'm four, and I say uh, something of the sort of, if that makes you feel like a man, smack me again. What? So that's our relationship, right? Mm-hmm. I was always bowing to the arts, to the education side to the knowledge but I was always questioning the stand or the way to do things or the way the world should be he was he's a very traditional person a very measured person a very I don't know old school guy so I was I was fighting him since a kid Mm, challenging the status quo and questioning authority my mother was quite rebellious too, I guess. So I think she also pushed that. She would be, it would be my mother who would say, Sebastian, the kid who's bullying you, if he punches you, punch him back and punch him really hard and knock him out. <laughs> it wouldn't be my father. My father would be like, no, 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 you have to talk. There's a good way to go about this. My mother would be like, no, just knock him out. He was the very measured one. That's interesting. Tell us more about your mom. Well, she's a, a kindergarten teacher. She worked in a, in boys' schools, just like I was raised in boys' schools. In a weird way, she always was the rebellious one. She was always wearing weird outfits just because she thought it was interesting to be weird and different. Not because her weird outfits actually looked any good or, or <laughs> made that much uh, aesthetical sense. My mother lives in her own cloud, is incredibly sweet and loving, but is quite aloof. At the same time, she's the kind of mother that I don't know if she's ever gone to to the hairdresser, for example, and never really cared much about aesthetics. So she's a very odd character, incredibly charming, incredibly loving, um, very aloof and in her own planet, but always as a odd guide as of a parallel reality that somehow things didn't need to be the way they were. I like that. You've painted a very in-depth portrait of your mm-hmm. childhood. It kind of sounds too like your dad was much more of the person who went by the book and your mom kind of played by her own rules. And maybe that's kind of where your creativity and your rebellious spirit came from. I, I would think so. And, and also I went through a lot of schools because of the traveling at the beginning. I don't know, drawing, for example, or coming up with ideas or solving things was was my thing it was the way i i learned that i was appreciated and i would get friends so in a weird way maybe until even to today i'll have my studio manager or some close person tell me that uh i need to remember that i'm i'm also worth as a person i'm not just worth for what i make it's weird in that sense like i think i'm i'm a uh, it's like i'm a weird hybrid for that You went to design school in Chile and you went to New York to pursue an MFA. What were you like in college? Were you like a playboy or were you like, did you mostly focus on art or functional design? I was the kind of kid that was, again, fighting the teachers a lot. Um, So I would do very well. But then, for example, I remember this one time um, in the main workshop class, I had, I think, A plus up to then. And the teacher asked us to create one of those designs where a person shines your shoes. Mm -hmm. That didn't make sense to me. I was like, I I don't want to make an apparatus for the year 2000 and something so that one person puts their shoe and the other one cleans it. When I said, I'm I'm not going to do it. Teacher said, okay, then you won't be approved and, and you'll get the lowest possible grade. And I was like, okay, I will. And that was it. And so I had a, a strange relationship with them. At the same time, I would spend a lot of time in, in design competitions. Um, so doing a lot of outside projects. 
And in, in Chile, the studying design, you're immediately considered, first, you, you have to be gay to study design, otherwise you can never be straight. Um, but then second, it's, it's considered the career you would study if you didn't have enough uh, points on the test to study architecture. So um, it's also a career that's very badly paid. So you've got to imagine I'm, I'm 18, 19. I am studying design because I like the tools it gives me, but I have no interest whatsoever in working for anyone afterwards. And I understand that at the time, the maximum salary you can make as a designer was probably something around a thousand dollars a month. Oh my goodness! Right. So imagine you're like, okay, a thousand dollars a month. Granted, life is cheaper over there, but still, if you fall in love uh, with someone from your same class, you have a max income between both of two thousand dollars. That means that uh, I don't know, you won't be able to send your kids to a good school. And at the same time, you would have to be working for whomever doing stuff that you probably don't want to do. So I, I understood that I, I needed to figure out different ways of being in charge of my career from the very beginning. And, and that's why basically uh, passing the grades I needed to pass, focusing on teachers I thought were interesting, doing outside curriculum projects and so on, uh, just was what I needed to do. There was no way around it. Very proactive about your own education then. Yes, definitely. Did you find that some of the instructors were appreciative of you challenging and questioning the idea of making a shoe shine apparatus <laughs> yeah, at that you know, time? It's really funny, but uh, with time, anyone who we've had criticism with today tells their student, oh, Sebastian was my favorite student and so on. And I go like, <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> such bullshit. You hated that I was rebelling. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's several of them that, tell their students today, yes, I, I helped him and blah, blah. And like, he, I always knew he had it in him or whatever. Oh yeah, sure. It's now. really funny. Jumping on the bandwagon. But I think as a teacher, I mean, I, I, I taught for about six years and it's really interesting to be challenged by a student as long as it's done respectfully. And mm -hmm. I, I think I always did it respectfully. I mean, you have to, I don't know, grade 30 kids who come with similar projects. Many of the one are copied from online things and so on. When you have a kid who is trying to do things differently and trying to challenge, even though it doesn't make your job easier as a teacher, you kind of respect him and you kind of yeah. wish him well. So yes, you have to do what you have to do. I need to downgrade you because you don't want to follow my rules, but I really hope your rules work for you. So I, I'm interested in the transition between Chile and New York because it sounds like you were an undergrad, even though you were very proactive about your own education, you were also in a small country where you had a big network, um, sure. a community. And then in New York, were you all on your own? Were you a small fish in a big pond? What happened? Well, um, in Chile, just I, I, because of the restrictions, I figured I needed a, a newspaper column, for example, because that was what architects had. And I, I was like, okay, I need to get my own newspaper column. So it was like, how do you figure that out? And basically, I, I understood that if I was the editor and I get this kid coming to offer me a newspaper column because he wants his own column, uh, what can I offer them? So I would arrive with uh, the I don't know, 54 subjects I would touch in the year, 16 columns pre-written, all of the illustrations for the columns, a PowerPoint presentation showing how many students come out of art schools versus design schools and a comparative study of how many offers there are in terms of uh, columns in all of the different newspapers and basically a, you need me and I'll do it for free if necessary. In a similar way, I then got offered a radio show and the radio show did very well. And then I got offered a TV show. Whoa, local celebrity. Right. By the time I had all that, I then got called by the general uh, right hand of the former president of Chile. I get asked to participate as a personal advisor for his campaign. Wow. As a student. No, no, no. I, I, let's say I graduated by age 23, 22. I was 26 and I had a TV show, a radio show, a newspaper column. I was teaching in three or four different universities. I had my own studio. I would self-fund my own public art with the money I would make from all of that and be broke as a result. And plus that, I was working as a personal advisor for the future president of Chile. Now, with that, you're like, okay, this is pretty great and pretty amazing. And you start to think you're kind of great. And yeah. it's, it's uh, wrong. 
you start um, drinking the Kool-Aid and uh, it doesn't help to go to a supermarket to buy groceries and have an old lady come up to you and say like, oh, I love what you've wrote or oh, this, this and that. And uh, you get your ego blown up and I became some sort of a, like a new rich of attention. Oh. And I realized, you know what, this is the time to drop everything. I needed to drop everything and leave. I had no money whatsoever. My parents are teachers. Uh, they never had any money. And the money I was making in all of these different things, I was constantly reinvesting and making work. Because I, at the end of the day, I make work, even if it's design, I make it as an artist. I make it for myself. And then uh, I'll give it to a gallery to sell uh, or I'll just keep it. I, I don't do what others want me to do. So I'm constantly self-funding. And then the public art is just a loss of money. So I had no money whatsoever. And I figured, okay, I need, I need a scholarship. I took a flight to New York and I went and went to Columbia school and I waited for um, the director of, of uh, the art school to receive me. So I had decided I'd done enough design and now needed to go into art. I arrived, the secretary says, uh, do you have an appointment? I said, no. She says, well, Mr. John Kessler uh, can't receive you right now and blah, blah. And I go like, that's okay. I just flew all the way from Chile. I'll wait. So they made me wait for about six, seven hours. In between, the director came in and out of his office, was probably a little annoyed that this kid was still out there. At some point, he's forced to receive me, and he's very cautious, and he says something like, uh, well, I'm so grateful that you've been here. This is great. I love your enthusiasm. Look, I'm going to hook you up with a student. They're going to tour you around the school, and I really hope uh, to have you here next year. It would be great. This is the way to apply, so on and so on. You're going to have my secretary's email just in case you have any doubts, and we wish you very well. And he finishes that. And I say, well, actually, I waited seven hours and came all the way here because I wanted you to tell me why I had to study at Columbia and not NYU. Oh. So suddenly he's taken aback back a little. <laughs> and then I go like, yeah, because I was studying your curriculum and there's these and these teachers that I think are quite good and make sense with this and this plan. But in these other areas, you have all these weaknesses and so on. And I, I think your school is great, but I wanted to hear it from you. So the director ends up offering me a scholarship. When I say, I thank you so much. I'll think about it. And I'll get back to you. Turning <laughs> I, the I swear this is true. <laughs> With that, then I go directly to NYU. And I, I kind of like the neighborhood in NYU more. I didn't know Columbia was a much better school. And I uh, arrive at NYU. I asked to speak to the director. They say again, do you have an appointment? No, he can't receive you. And I said, well, I just got offered a scholarship in Columbia. And I wanted to see if you guys could top it. I ended up getting a scholarship in, U in NYU and I ended up studying in NYU. So basically you pitted the schools against each other. Well, I, I, I did all I could. I mean, I needed, I needed a way out. I had, so just like I had to figure out how to get a column, I had to figure out how to get a scholarship. I love the whole story because it's incredibly audacious, right? But an audacity that you probably got from being such a big fish back home with your own TV show and drinking the Kool-Aid, as you said. And yet it's this self-awareness that it's gone to your head that drives you to go pit these schools against each other. It's brilliant. I mean, a designer designs stuff for other people in general as a definition. Mm -hmm. But we forget that we're our first client, right? And designing is just learning, understanding how parts move and, and what makes things happen. And uh, we should be our first and most important client. And my problems should be my first problems to solve. So here I had a problem. I needed out. I needed to get out of a small country where my head was getting too big. And I, I was thinking I, I knew enough and, and I needed to start from scratch. And I didn't have the money. So I needed a, a way to have some sort of a base, had some sort of a routine, a structure in which I could start going to class. And in the meanwhile, figuring out how the system worked in New York. Well, you're absolutely right that we should be our first clients and solve our problems first. And it's remarkably self-aware that you gave up all of the attention and perks of being such a big man on campus back in Chile. In another example of self-awareness, you talk about this in your TED Talk, where you made a transition from being perceived as a, a young dreamer, a naive artist. You were pitching all of your creative ideas and they were getting rejected. Mm -hmm. And you became aware that you needed to change how you were being perceived. Sure. Can you elaborate on that story? You talk about it so eloquently in the TED Talk that we'll definitely share that link with our listeners. 
But I want to hear the whole backstory to that. <laughs> when I came out of school, I decided, okay, the dream is to be the best designer I possibly can. And I'm, I'm not going to be uh, humble about it. I, wanna, I wanted to be the best. I still want to be the best. And I want to be the best artist too. And it's something that we're not allowed to say in the arts. It's supposed to be such a no-no and it's supposed to be so arrogant and, and pretentious. Nevertheless, if you think of, of athletes, it's, it's actually very encouraged to say, look, I would love to one day be able to, to create a new record. I would love to be able to, to create a new world record and I'm willing to dedicate my life, sacrifice my personal life and sacrifice everything just to push that barrier a tiny bit. Everyone applauds you and everyone cheers you up and, and people will, will put their logos on you and they'll, they'll all like try to get you to do it. When you're in the arts, you're never allowed to say that. You're never allowed to, to pretend to want to do anything too big. It's immediately seen wrong. And, and, and I, think that's, I, I think that's terrible. If you're super ambitious, like I was, and, and you wanted to do something at an existential level, well, wait, for me, as I told you before, I don't think my life is worth much except for what I make. I actually don't even care if I'm happy or not. I care if I'm tranquil. When that's your thing, you need to break all of these giant dreams down into possible steps. And at the beginning, the first one, you're out of school, you're trying to, to self-sustain, you're reading ramen noodles, you basically have enough money to pay your bill of uh, your cell phone and that's it. You need to figure out ways to move. And in general, you just get rejected. For me, the first I started with, I'm gonna take two years to try and present every single proposal I can. And if in two years I cannot pay my basic costs, I will walk into an advertising agency and get a job as a creative director. That was the plan. And having that tranquility of, okay, because I mean, every single project I was presenting was being turned down again and again and again. I mean, I was presenting, I don't know, a hundred projects a year. I was working uh, 14 hour days, trying everything I could possibly try. And in general, being constantly rejected again and again and again. And little by little, uh, your only sort of tranquility is, okay, I've got six months to go. If this thing still doesn't pick up, I can quit. And that quitting, that, that possibility of breaking it down into steps, the first step was just to be able to pay my bills uh, out of my own work, out of my own ideas, not ideas I would do for others, was vital. And, and, and so you start a slow progression in which you start trying out every single trick that you can. And in the meanwhile, you're, you're learning. So it's stupid things that, for example, um, I remember analyzing designers web pages and I was 22 and I realized, okay, if I need to be taken seriously, I need a website that has several languages, right? Cause that's Philippe Stark's website at the time had like five or eight different languages. So I would ask all my friends in, in university to basically translate all my texts into like the guy who was from the exchange program from Japan, he would do it to Japanese, someone to French, someone to German. Then it was like, okay, I need a professional photo. I need to look good. So I would borrow a friend's suit and do another trade with a friend who was a photographer and get him to take a professional photo uh, photo. And then I figured you need to have a signature because all these guys have a signature almost on top of it. So if you have a signature, you're legit because that's kind of saying, Oh, you are established. And you're basically trying everything out. When you arrive uh, dressed in a suit with a series of very nice cards, which each card costs you, I don't know, three bucks because it's the heaviest card of all of them. <laughs> and you arrive with a, uh, two cell phones and a Palm Pilot at the time, that was like our way of being organized, <laughs> trying to show codes that you were organized. You're trying to do everything you can in terms of language to say, hey, I'm responsible. Hey, I deserve a chance. Hey, please listen to my ideas. And little by little, you understand what works, which is normally way more subtle than those things. It's normally uh, you just acquire enough experience and you acquire enough weight uh, and character that, that you know what you're talking about and you know how to read people and you know how to understand the problem that maybe they don't know how to express. And, and little by little, things start changing and little by little, you 
I don't know, get more publications and appear more in magazines and websites and so on. And little by little, it's a little easier. And, and the secretary starts taking your, your phone calls and you every now and then try something outlandish and it works and then so on. It's a long, long process. It's like the Malcolm Gladwell tipping point. And was there a personal transformation going on at the same time? Or were you steady knowing how you were perceived externally? I, I think I'm, I'm the same guy I've always been since I'm five. I feel I haven't changed much. I mean, you're naturally maturing and you're developing more sensibilities and you're learning, right? Sure. That's one of the things I love of New York. And the main reason why I'm here is that in New York, the level of competition is so high. The environment you're in is so sophisticated, it's so exquisite that every day I make mistakes, every day I fuck up. And every day I learn from it. And that's something that uh, in other environments, you, it's easier to get comfortable with. And, and, and I think that process is you, you're just training. You're, you're training and training and training and getting better and better and better. My soul is the same one. I, I haven't changed. I'm the same kid. I'm actually very proud that my dreamer side is still fully intact, uncorrupted. It hasn't been broken. I've seen a lot of friends have their, their souls uh, crushed a bit, have their expectations crushed. And mm-hmm. I'm as tough as can be on the outside, but um, the, the little Sebastian in me is like super happy and still like good in there. He's still healthy. I have a question about training because you, you talk about doing that and comparing yourself to an athlete or an Olympian. So it's easy to understand how those people train. But when you're trying to train yourself creatively, are there ways of doing that or methods that are really helpful for you to train your creative side of your brain? Sure, sure. Um, so I think there's lots of things. Uh, one is super simple. You've got to put in the amount of hours, right? And the reality is the vast majority of professionals will work eight hours. If, if I'm working uh, 14 hours, it means I've got four hours over someone else. That's uh, half a lifetime in, uh, in a life, right? So first, it's just that you need to put in the extra hours. For me, it's extremely important to be as aware of the highest level of information as I can. So I wake up at six and I read about 10 newspapers every day. Together with reading 10 newspapers and knowing exactly what's going on and everything from economics to uh, terrorism to uh, politics to so on, I'll check the 20 top YouTube videos and I'll know what's going on in pop culture and know that, I don't know, everyone's following Pokemon Go this weekend or that um, uh, Casey Neistat decided to get a new studio. That consumption of information, which I'm illustrating now in two things, but it could be two things if I was in front of you, I would be paying attention to what you're saying, but I would really be looking at how you move your fingers, how you dress, the way you move your smile to one way or to another. Um, Every single little detail I can see that can give me more information about who you are and what you're saying besides whatever is coming out of your mouth, right? All the way to walking down the street, seeing things that hopefully other people aren't seeing. I think that in of itself is enormous because it means that you're consuming a huge amount of information that then you need to learn how to distill. And the distilling part is is vital too because a lot of people do brainstormings and, and different forms of creativity, right? And if you think of the athlete, the athlete trains to a point where they can train no more. We've all heard the boxer who says, uh, you know what, I've trained everything I can do the last two, three days they rest because there's no point in overtraining, right? Here it's similar. You're consuming information, consuming information as much as you can, and then you cannot think. You need to let the guttural part of you, the unconscious side of you do the connections. Because in the same way as, I don't know, and a football player doesn't have three seconds to figure out the speed of his player, the wind direction, and and where he's moving to be able to throw the ball and hit the right mark. It's instinctual. You need to be thinking at an instinctual level because it's so much information. There's no way you can rationally break it down. You need to let your instincts do it. And that sometimes can happen uh, during the day in different moments, but then you can also force it. I personally, every now and then, my studio, by the way, everyone leaves at four. So I'm left alone at four and the studio's empty and it's my favorite moment. 
What works for me when I need to force an idea is I put on really loud music. I could have a uh, ACDC or guns and roses. I'm old school. Um, and then I need to start thumping my foot, right? I'm thumping my foot and the thumping of the foot works in a weird way, almost like for my friends who meditate saying, um, it's basically generating energy. It's generating energy, generating energy, generating energy in a crescendo, and it's blocking any thoughts out of my head. I have all the papers in front of me. I know what I'm trying to break down. I know what I'm trying to solve. I know I can't do it rationally. And so at some point you generate, you're pumping, 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 and you see something, you see something, you scribble it down as quick as you can, because you've got a half second, right? Of, of that interface between one side of the brain and the other, or one aspect of your persona and the other. And you can't judge it. You can't try to figure it out. You just got to take it down. And if there's more coming, it's almost like a time portal in a movie where the time portal opened up and a ton of shit comes out from another era. You've got to let it come out and know that that portal is going to close up soon. So you try to get as much as you can out of it. So I'm scribbling like crazy. I'm drawing. And I draw, I don't scribble because maybe I'm not eloquent enough as a writer that I can't put into words precisely enough the images that I'm seeing, right? But I, I can draw relatively well. And so if I'm drawing something, I'm not just drawing the representation of what it is that I saw, but there's also going to be some sort of a, a tone expressed, almost like when you're writing music, right? There's, is this humorous? Is, it, is this serious? Is this uh, lighthearted? Is it deep? Mm. All of that gets captured in the association that gets captured there. And I move the paper out of my way and I continue. And I do that for whatever amount of time it is. If my girlfriend is texting or whatever, I, she knows that I'm sorry, I went into one of those and I couldn't answer. And I'll go for as long as the window's open and then that's it. You're done. <laughs> and then do you need a cigarette? Like what? <laughs> Almost, right? Uh, it is actually very orgasmic in a weird way. To that, I don't know, add that I wake up in the morning, I do 300 abs, I have uh, weights and stuff at the studio. So in between things, I'm putting in a workout, I'm being super obsessive and anal about what I eat and so on. It's my whole life is nothing but this. My family's in Chile. This is my life. I have a few friends, a lot of people I know, but that's it. And my girlfriend, that's it. That's my life. And in general, it's like, I feel like girlfriends have always complained that like, I'll do whatever they want to do. Whatever restaurant you want to go, let's go. Wherever you want to go on vacation, let's go. I'm not the uh, proactive guy. I don't want to, oh, let's go check out this restaurant that sounds so great. Oh, I checked out the menu that's going to have this or that. I don't care. I don't care what I eat. I don't care where I go. Maybe when it, if it's movies, I don't want to watch really bad movies, but that's about it. I order the same stuff from a restaurant all the time. I don't know. This is, this is all I do. This is, this is my life. I love how your physical training is similar to your mental training. It's almost like your everything about you is, is training. But I also find it fascinating that you aren't uh, interested in, in making decisions about going out or going to see things or anything specific. Where does that come from where you're just totally laid back and OK with someone else making the decisions for you outside of, of work? I, I think you physically can't. When you when you see these like there's there's lots of I don't know people that dress in a certain way and they'll give you a story about how dressing all the time in the same way helps them not think about it. I think that's true. My studio manager and I have an understanding where I don't need to know what is happening two days from now, and I shouldn't know. So I can focus on all the stuff I need to focus on because I'm working on forty projects in parallel. So I'm like, an, like overheating, trying to figure out a million things and she is figuring other stuff out. And then I'm checking out with the team that everyone's working. But for example, right now with you guys, I didn't know if this was today or it was next week. Like I, got, I get told in the morning at X hour, uh, you have um, the, the podcast and then I get reminded uh, half an hour before and I get reminded again, 10 minutes after. That's it. But I need that because 
if I was worried about that or I was worried about what I'm going to eat, I'm, I'm using up uh, space in my hard drive, mental hard drive that I don't have. Well, thank goodness for us. You have an on top of it <laughs> studio manager. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank God for me, too. You mentioned previously before you left Chile for New York that you were self-funding a lot of projects and you didn't have a lot of money. I'm just curious to understand how you support yourself and, and your studio. In Chile, when I did the big public art projects, I started by basically making parties. I realized, OK, I need to save up X amount of money. And I, I have a, a pretty aristocratic surname that comes up a lot because in Chile, being called the Rasuris is almost like being called Kennedy here. But the fact is that the Rasuris family is huge in Chile and I wore... I don't know, secondhand clothes as a kid. And my parents, if they had any money, it would be to send us to uh, watch theater or make sure that we had violin classes as a kid and so on. Um, I had no money whatsoever. I've never had any money. I don't have anything. I don't have a car. I don't own a home. Absolutely everything I have, I put back in the work. I always keep in an account uh, enough money to pay my people for a year, more or less. And that's it. I don't really care about having stuff. When you're just starting and you have no leverage and you have no one who's really willing to pay for stuff, the closest thing I could do as a, as a kid is parties. So it's like, okay, I need to get all my friends who are DJs to decide that they're willing to play for free for this party that will fund the public art project. And we would find venues that were willing to keep all the alcohol and I would uh, promise them that I would bring in 3,000 kids and I would get every single one of those five DJ friends you have to make sure that each one brought another DJ friend and each one told all their friends. And then we would set up two towers and have them sort of do DJ fights and fight each other with song after song. So suddenly I'm in the middle of doing illegitimate parties to raise money so I can pull off a public art project. And I'm having to deal with the cops and having to deal with people that do this for a living, that you're suddenly taking away their market share and they're super pissed off and getting threatened. But I mean, you would do what you can. And it's always been that way. For example, for a lot of my work in, in the limited edition design world, right? It's very expensive to make and I had no money to fund those pieces. So at the beginning, no gallery is gonna give you money up front. So you can go and make stuff. So basically I would find a friend that had some money and say, you know what, what if I design you this piece and you keep it, it's for you, but you pay the production cost, which is really expensive because I want to make it in this and this way. And you let me photograph it and you let me show it. And that's the deal. So I would get a friend to do that first. So suddenly I have a beautiful photo of a beautiful object that's no longer mine but that I was able to make. And with that, you show that to someone else and you say, how about you fund this piece? And we get to co-own it. I give you all the, uh, all, all, all the, the receipts so that you are paying other people. You don't pay me a cent. We co-own the piece. And if I can sell it, you give me two years. If I can sell it, we pay you back your money and we split 50% of whatever I take. And suddenly you can offer the gallery or suddenly you can offer some, someone a piece that someone else can buy. And suddenly maybe you can sell that and get a chunk from that. And maybe the next one you can uh, half produce, or maybe you're only getting someone to chip in and help you on one and you're funding the other. I'm always like that. It's always funding one, the other, and little by little you get better, you get better. Your income gets better. There's more and more people buying your work. And suddenly uh, the galleries are offering to, to fund everything. And, and suddenly, for the first time, you're getting an institution to say, you know what, we'll fund your public art project. But it's, it's years. It's uh, 15 years of doing it on your own. And in the meanwhile, you're eating ramen noodles and uh, <laughs> whatever, right? I guess the logical part of me is also wondering, like, what's your plan? I mean, if, if getting money and feeling secure is not really part of your motivation or your goals, what is your goal? Like, what's your idea of legacy? What is it that you, you want to get out of this life that you're living? My dream was always to get to be 80 or 90. And I always imagined a plane hanger filled with every single object 
or space situation that you could imagine being reimagined where you would walk into this place where someone was inviting you to see that you didn't have to accept life the way others had figured it out. You didn't have to accept the life that others decided was the right way. Everything could be reimagined life complete. And this would be some sort of a, of an encyclopedia, a little encyclopedia of everything bought out again. That was always the dream. And it was always, look, it doesn't matter if I'm happy or not. It doesn't matter if anything, if I get to that, my life was worthwhile. And I did a tiny little dent into the system. And by doing this again and again and again and again, so many times, hopefully you're getting other people to believe in it and not just appreciate that you did it, but believe that they can. And that was always the plan. And at some point it was like, you know what? That'll take too long. I need to move and I need to move faster. So now I'm trying to do all of that in five years. So we're actually starting a whole new project. It's called Life Reimagined. And for the next five years, I'm going to be designing at least two new things a week. Wow. Of stuff that needs to be redesigned. And by designing, it's like, 3D printing, the prototype, photographing, testing it out, everything. That's while doing the gallery shows, while doing the public art, while doing everything else. So it's super masochistic, but you know what? I don't know. I, I, it can't wait. It has to be now. Is this the project that you mentioned to me in New York that you were working on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very excited about it. When are you starting this or are you already uh, we're in? Already, we're already working on it. Um, we're not ready to launch yet. When you're, I'm, I'm 38, sorry, 39. Last, last week was my birthday. I feel like at this age, you better have everything super clear. You still have all the energy. You're as prepared as you could be. Like, I feel like a, I know, a fucking mercenary. Like, I'm trained tough as nails and... I understand the system. I understand everything. I need to make it happen now while I'm still super energetic and I still have a a pulse of what's going on. I feel like the moment you're 50 or something, you continue to gain an experience, but you're losing a little bit of your edge. You're losing the ability to connect and understand what's going on. And then you know too much. There's a moment where you know too much and it's very hard to break with what you know. It's kind of like why the... I don't know, the Rolling Stones can't get a a number one hit today, even if they wanted to. It just physically can, right? And so it's like you need to get your your albums and your work, at least the big chunk of it before that. And then you continue working forever. But this this next five years are the most important in my life. Is that the thing you're most scared of is is getting to the point where you can't do the same kind of work? Not really. I'm not really afraid of much. I, I only have hope. Like I, I know I'm not going to chicken out. I know I'll be working like crazy. I would hope I don't get, I don't know, a fucking brain tumor or something. I hope I think I continue to live and things are okay. But and then there's an aspect of luck in everything. It's like, there's only a certain amount that you can figure out and you can put your elbow on and push it. There's a part where either things happen and, uh, or they don't. So I'm going to do everything I can do. And I have that tranquility. I'll, I'll die exhausted. Done. That's it. I did everything I could. Did I get a little bit of luck just at the moment I needed it? I would hope so. That would be amazing. Was I lucky that I didn't have any illnesses or any big problems? I really hope so. That's it. It's good that you brought up death because mortality is something and a theme you investigate in your work, often with humor. It's often with a bit of dark humor or morbidity, but it sounds like death isn't something that you fear. It's just something that you know could happen at any point and you want to get as much in before it happens. Sure. Is that an accurate characteristic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very accurate. Uh, There's different stories as to why death is important. But um, so the, the first little base one is simply that my uncle, who is the artist of the family, dies just before I'm born and he dies of diabetes and he had decided not to look after himself. 
for whatever reason, I looked like that guy. And so I get called by my dead uncle's name growing up. You can imagine that's already <laughs> has somewhat of a connection. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, my grandfather, who I lived with for a while, because my parents didn't have money to live on their own and were living in like a small flat that uh, was on the ground floor of my grandfather's house. I would look after him and I would shave him and uh, walk him and help him walk when he couldn't walk that well and, and listen to his stories and his advice. And uh, then I was the only grandson allowed to carry the coffin when he died with, uh, with, with my father and his uncles and so on. So there's a sense of, you, you understand that mortality is there, right? But that's one aspect. And, and I had, again, I had a very nice childhood. Just understanding that mortality is a real part of life and it's not something that is hidden from you, I think is vital. The other vital thing was I remember reading this book by Roald Dahl, like this British author of books for kids that did uh, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the BFG and a ton of beautiful books. And Roald Dahl has a book called Boy. And Boy is Roald Dahl's childhood stories of when he was a kid. But it's him as an adult remembering his childhood stories. And I remember reading that as a kid and beyond being entertained by his stories, what I understood was I need to one day have lived a life that I can narrate. And that's what life is about. You need to be able to leave a book for other people to read. And that means that you need to live today, everything that will be worth narrating tomorrow, even if it's scary, even if it goes against the system, even if it hasn't been done, even if people tell you that it's wrong. You need to live life as if you were going to tell it to someone someday and someone might be entertained and maybe inspired by it and maybe do other things. For me, death is vital. It's the only way to, in a way, be free. It is the understanding that we could die tomorrow that helps us put things into perspective, that helps us be brave and quit the job we don't want to do. And uh, I, I don't know, quit the relationship that we know it doesn't work or uh, simply Go for those things that scare us. Because if I'm going to die pretty soon, the fear I have right now isn't that important. And so I try to bring death in a different ways, right, into our routines. I, I bring it normally with a bit of humor because humor is, is like a Vaseline. It helps uh, us talk about issues that we wouldn't necessarily want to talk about. Yeah, it lubes everything up. It lubes everything up. It helps everything up. And, and so I think that's that's a vital part for me. It's a beautiful part. You know, as you're saying this, it, it's fascinating to me. I grew up with so many American kids who had this sense of invincibility during maybe some of their most productive years. But that invincibility makes them feel like they have all the time in the world. And I don't know that that's a good thing. I saw a lot of people sort of waste energy and enthusiasm until they got too tired to, to follow through on their ideas. Exactly, exactly. And, it's, and that sense of invincibility is really wrong. That's why I'm so obsessed with understanding, right? I'm so obsessed with reading and reading and, and trying to learn and see and watch and check because I want to be aware, right? If, if you feel invincible, you could be basically fearless, right? Mm -hmm. But being fearless means that you are not afraid of something, that you're not aware of the fear. Being brave is when you're aware and you decide to go at it anyway. I think that's, that's the vital key aspect. You need to understand how hard it is and then still have the courage to go at it. But being able to see it, to look at it in the face, whether it's death or a project or the difficulty of achieving your dream as a professional, if you have the courage to look at it, to analyze it, to see it from any perspective, you have a bigger chance of tackling it. But you will be afraid. Of course, you have to be scared shitless if you're seeing what you're up against. It's like, it's hard. But that's way better than to decide not to and to tackle it when it comes or to decide not to and to think that you're above it or to decide that you're just going to run against it in rage or in fear or in a fearless way. That's why awareness is so important. That's why every single thing I do is just inviting you to look again. If you think of any design I've done, my designs aren't aesthetical, right? Design comes from disegno, the Italian to draw. And my designs are not pretty. I don't do pretty stuff. My designs, every single one of them is the representation of an idea. It is done 
trying to illustrate with an icon an element that we all know that suddenly has been transformed or suddenly has been appropriated or suddenly has been switched so you can be aware of something you weren't aware, whether it's a possibility or something that was always there. That's what's vital, but that's because the moment we're aware, though, that's the moment we're free. The moment you're aware, that's the moment you can make decisions. Yeah, and that moment when you become aware of a new perspective is the same moment that you feel alive and excited because what you know is not just what you knew. Exactly. And it's, it's kind of that I I imagine therefore I am right. It's not, I see therefore I am, or it's like, I see again, therefore I am, or I see what was there that hadn't been seen. Like I have stupid stuff, but it's like, for example, I have this door that I love that's right next to me and the door has two viewers. That's all there is to it. It's a white iconic classic door Every single door has one viewer to look through. My door has two viewers. And it's simply saying, you don't need to close an eye. Mm -hmm. What if you open the other one? We've had telescopes forever, right? But we're not pirates anymore. We've had binoculars for a while. And it's actually kind of retarded that we continue to close one eye to peep through in it. So the door is looking at you and is inviting you to open the other eye, both in a metaphorical way and in a physical way. That door was exhibited at a museum and the door came back to my studio with a smudge, a brown smudge between the two viewers. And I didn't know what the smudge was. I was like, that's so weird. It looks like a nose. And then I realized it was grease of the noses of thousands of people that had put their nose up against to look through because they couldn't believe that this actually worked. Right. So that door didn't exist before. Right. I made a door with two viewers that already justifies my life. What if I could pull that off again and again and again, like two times a week for fucking my lifetime? It would be like a beautiful little book. Like I I don't care about um, JK Rowling or or, or, um, the Lord of the Rings and these, but I love that the people that read them always mention something like this author created a universe and I love going into that universe. It's, it's, it's comforting. And it's a universe where all these things were reimagined. What if we could do that with, with objects, with our reality, where you're not creating a new reality uh, that's completely foreign. It's not a fantasy reality. It's our own. It's just the way it could be in a parallel world, maybe. Yeah, or the way it could be in the not-so-distant future. Exactly. And there's so many issues where they always have that meme where... Um, It says, uh, you're a designer, you're not solving the world or whatever, right? Uh, Bullshit. Right. (laughs) Right? Fuck that. (laughs) Think of simple things. There's um, the cigarette box in half of the planet is divided 50% to the general uh, surgeon's warning, right? That tobacco can produce cancer and the other 50% to the tobacco companies. Such a beautiful design example where... 50% of the design gets designed by the bad guys that want to make money and they don't care if you die. And the other 50% is designed by the people that are trying to say, hey, don't do this, don't do this, you could die. One way to go at it is the traditional way. But what if you could have an idea that could be more influential than the current way it's doing it? What if your idea can simply take down the consumption in a 10%? How many lives would you be saving? You're in one single design problem. You could be doing as much as fucking Bill Gates is doing, uh, trying to save uh, diseases. There's a million opportunities for this sort of shit. And it's just about us being able to see stuff. Some of our designs are just there to make a smile. I do. The door is just supposed to get you to smile. That's it. It's not going to do anything else. But I stole a smile from you. I stole a smile from thousands of people that enough was, was amazing. If you can do something that really helps, then you have to. It's, it's a, a moral imperative. You have to do that. And I need to create the platform to be big enough so that I can continue to be listened to and I can work just for the people that are, have the most influential power right now. Right? And, and that requires building a platform. That requires continuing to build a name. That requires continuing to prove yourself. I feel like we could talk to you for another 16 hours and still have only scratched the surface. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Thank you, girls. Amazing. I'm exhausted. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, we're exhausted too. It was as good for us, um, hopefully, Great. as it was so for you. We'll, both, we'll all light cigarettes then. Right. Yes. <laughs> And and please tell us that we can call you to come back on the podcast again because of course, we want to keep course. up with this work that this amazing work that you're doing. No, I mean I think you've you've done such an incredible work. I think this podcast is incredible. It's amazing. Every designer is in their own studio, probably feeling often isolated, trying to go up against the world and the system and and it's vital to hear from other people and hear what others are up to and how they try to do it. And I think that's already an incredible, an incredible platform uh, that alone without adding to all the, the design milk websites and everything else. It's, it's such an important contribution. I'm, I'm very uh, humbled and, and honored to, to be able to contribute with my view of how I see things and what I try to do. Thank you. If you could just let us know where our listeners can find out more information about all of your projects. I hope you can follow me on Instagram. It would be amazing. It's Sebastian Studio. So at Sebastian Studio. And then the website is meetsebastian.com because my surname again is horrible and no one can spell it or remember it. <laughs> so meet as if we've just met meetsebastian.com. And then Facebook, you've got to go for the surname, which sucks. So it's Sebastian and then Erasuris, E-R-R-A-Z-U-R-I-Z. -R -R Thank you. Thank you. Take care, eh? I knew that was going to be a powerful conversation. Yeah, it was very intense, too, just thinking about, you know, when, when he was younger and being four or five, six and, and having to go through all of these quizzes or artistic tests with his father. Um, and the fact that he embraced it and loved it is so unique because a lot of times when children are rigorously trained or when parents force things upon children, they tend to rebel at some point, but he never seemed to do that. I mean, he definitely rebelled in the sense of you know, he fought his dad from a creative perspective or a process perspective, but he never really rebelled. He's no stranger to challenging authority. He didn't rebel against mm -hmm. the whole idea and he didn't rebel against his dad's rigor. He embraced it. And it sounds like he's also continuing to do these kinds of things to himself with training, not only physically, but mentally still. Oh, yeah. He holds himself to the same rigor that his father always did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thank goodness for that, because we do need art Olympians. We do need people who hold themselves to those kinds of standards. And he's absolutely right when he talks about designing half of the cigarette box, that design can make a huge difference in the world. And in order to be able to make a big difference like Bill Gates, you have to achieve a certain platform. But he's a he's a unique individual. It's just like Olympians, right? Not everyone's cut out for it. Yeah, the discipline I think that he has in his life is rare. I'm excited about his new project too. I'm really interested to see what he's gonna create with Life Reimagined. Oh my God, I'm so thrilled. It's a huge project to undertake, but I admire his foresight that this is the prime time in his life when he needs to take the reins and run with it as fast as he can yeah. before, you know, things start to change in his brain and in his physicality. It's definitely admirable. We didn't get to ask him this, but what if he has a kid? Oh yeah. I don't know. Right. I had a lot of questions to ask him about how his past has influenced a lot of his current work. So we for sure need to get him back on and talk about a couple more details about his his actual pieces, which we didn't even get into, really. I know because there was too much other good stuff. The other thing that I think was really interesting about him is that he approaches art and design in an entirely different way than Robert Brunner. Yeah. And yeah. I love that you could be successful no matter what approach you take. And so that goes to show that you don't have to navigate in a specific way or adhere to certain rules in order to be successful. And I, I think that that's really important to show people because people are always looking for somebody to give them a map. Yeah, they want a map or a formula or something or some sort of validation that they're doing it right, like following the recipe. Right, but there isn't one. He's tailored a very Sebastian Arazari specific approach. 
right? I love that he shared that whole experience of putting on the ACDC and thumping his foot until something, you know, connects between the two sides of his brain and he gets it out. And I think it's so important for other designers and artists to, especially if they're feeling a little lost or like they need the validation, to just tap into their own self-awareness and figure out what works for them and then just keep going in that direction. You know, if this works for you, then it's working. And that's all you need to know. Like, keep doing what's working for you. I thought his putting on the loud music and thumping of his foot was really interesting, specifically because my husband just started learning how to play the drums. And, you know, you have to hit a pedal for the bass drum. And then you've got a bunch of other drums and two drumsticks and, you know, um, all kinds of things to think about. And there's a rhythm. But the interesting thing about being a drummer is that if you start to think about or realize what's actually happening or um, take yourself out of that place where your hands are just like moving, almost like it's not even you. Once you start to think about it, you lose it. You're absolutely right. And I think it's sports, it's dancing, it's music. You have to get to a place where your your intuition and your instincts take over. And you're right. Not. And he talked about that subconscious thing that, that makes those connections, exercising or doing something that becomes almost meditative or rhythmic and instinctual until you get to something, some sort of realization. And I love that he acknowledged that sometimes you do have to force creativity because first of all, we live in a practical world that lives on a schedule and a timeline. And so much of the like the common advice out there is to take a break, get away from it. Um, don't try and force it. Well, sometimes you don't have the luxury of not trying to force it, right? Sometimes you really need an idea and just showing up and being there and waiting for it to come feels sometimes like the right thing to do, but more often than not, it feels so counterproductive and, and so frustrating. The fact that he's got a method for actually forcing something to come actually gives me a lot of hope. It, it's, a, it's a real tool. Yeah, and he doesn't ever say in our conversation that, you know, he's unique in that he can do this. It seems as though he believes that you may be able to train yourself to do these things. Albeit he started at a young age, so he might have an, an advantage in doing it so young, but there's still hope that people can learn from this or develop their own ways of working through or breaking through. Oh, I want to talk to him about communication as well, because he's such an excellent communicator. And that's what his work does so well, right, is communicate these ideas and this perspective shift. Well, I would say if anybody's interested in hearing more from him, absolutely watch his TED Talk. It is really great. Oh, yes. That's a good start. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Please subscribe to Clever on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. Read the show notes and see images of Sebastian's work at cleverpodcast.com. And we also have the video of his TED Talk in our show notes, too. So check that out. And connect with us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We always love to hear from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modell of Your Studio with music by L1011.